uh, text this week, I asked for a day of prayer and fasting today for the nation, for the upcoming election, and so forth. Well, with that is a question, <clears throat> and the question is, should, be, should political issues become something we focus on in church? That's, you know, is, is it, should it be there? And we showed a video during the prayer time, and the reason we showed that video is uh, earlier in the week, this week, I think it was on Tuesday, the Lord told me, he said, if this election is dropped, and of course he kind of talks to me the way I talk to him, and we've talked about dropping the ball and, and so forth, and you know what that means, if you drop the ball while well, you lose it. And so he was just talking to me on the, on the basis of how we communicate. And he said, if this election is dropped, judgment will begin with the church. And he's referring to 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven forward right in that area. So with that in mind, we showed a video that uh, an, another man who really has no skin in the game at all, uh, the Lord gave him specific instructions on speaking to America, specifically the American church, about what's coming in the election and so forth. We played that during prayer time. So if you want to watch that, it'll be online. We took excerpts out of his message and played it during prayer time to kind of go along with this. And it was after he told me what he told to me, I went, whoa, I know this is serious, but evidently we're really not seeing the magnitude of this. Right. Well, the video during prayer time helps explain it a little bit more and, and hopefully will will motivate the church a bit. But I want to answer this question about church and political issues. Um, I honestly believe the church in America is asleep, by and large. It's not every person, by and large. We are asleep as Christians. We are dropping the ball when it comes to preserving the godliness in this nation. And we, we don't see the desperate position this country has come to from God's perspective, how he sees it. I don't believe we're, we're seeing it. So to answer the question, let me make a statement right from the beginning. I've said this numerous times before, but not everybody's listening all the time. So let me just restate my position. I am absolutely not pro-Trump and anti-Biden. And I'm absolutely not pro-Biden and anti-Trump. I am pro-righteousness, anti-wickedness. Yes. Yes. And I want that extremely plain right from the beginning. This is not about a man. I've said before, I particularly don't even like Trump's personality. It's, he's got his issues. But you know what? It works perfect to get in there and do what he's doing. Because I would have folded my cards and left a long time ago. I, I don't have that brashness that he has, and people hate him for it, but it's exactly what God needed to, to confront some things. Um, but here's the deal. When it comes to elections and it comes to politics and it comes to government, I'm pro-righteousness, anti-wickedness. Humans choose one side or the other. So as a result, names come up. Because certain names choose wickedness and certain names lean more towards righteousness. So you have to call names. Yep, exactly. Or we're, we're just being pitiful wimps. Well, we don't want to offend anybody. Well, this is not the point. The point is we're the salt of the earth and we can't lose our saltiness or we're useless to the kingdom of God. Salt goes in and affects everything. And if we're no longer capable of going in and affecting anything, from God's perspective, we're useless to them. Yeah, but we've got lots of people coming to church and big offerings. We're useless to him. See, the American culture has picked up some weird things of determining success. If numbers and money is the determination of the success of a church, we need to convert Muslim. Because they got a lot more people and they got lots more money than we have. God doesn't look at numbers and money. It doesn't impress him. 
I'm just saying. So let's just call names what they are. We have numerous parties in America, political parties. And most of them, whether they're trying to do good or otherwise, is really beside the point. Most of them are non-effective. Because sadly to say, we live in a country that is a two-party system. And it's rare that anybody outside of those two parties gets elected to anything. It's, it's a two-party system. We have one party that is pro-God and one party that is anti-God. Yep. And I'll explain that here in just a bit. The party that is pro-God is the Republicans. Do they have corruption in them? Yes. But their platform is still pro-God. And we have one party that their platform is anti-God. The Republicans support the independence and liberties of the church and the need for society to conform to certain spiritual norms. That is their platform. In other words, it's the, the ground rules they run by. The Democrats... Their platform is set up to neuter the church and ultimately conform the church to the, demo, uh, the demonic agendas and wickedness of society. That's the two general differences between the two. So if you're honestly looking for righteousness versus wickedness, it will automatically cause you to choose a side. I mean, we're not, we're voting for people. So it causes you to choose people. Why do I lean, and I'll say it this way. If Biden was the Republican and Trump was the Democrat, I'd, I'd just reverse my stance. This isn't about a person. This is about an agenda and this is about righteousness versus wickedness. You say, well, why do you have to make a distinction for the freedom of the gospel to be proclaimed and continue to be proclaimed in this country and for people to be saved, we must have a pro-God, pro-gospel Christianity government. Amen. We must remove that, we will be shut down eventually. So the purpose of the kingdom, the purpose of the gospel will be squelched, and we will be forced to do same-sex marriages, we will be forced to employ LGBTQ people, we will be forced to endorse abortions, we will be forced to compromise because we will have an anti-God government. So that's why it's important. Should this be talked about at church? Yeah, I've, I, I hear things too, and people say things to me, and, and it's been compared to what some, compared to what President Trump goes through, I, I have a 100% peaceful life. <laughs> but I've been told, you know, you, you just need to keep church about Jesus and the Bible. We're coming to hear the word. We're coming to hear about God, and don't bring politics or social issues into the church, okay? So in an effort to stay objective, I will usually follow that with a line of questioning. I want to know where they're coming from. So the main question you have to ask is why? Why do we want to talk just about Bible in church? Well, because we're Christians and we're trying to serve God. Well, why are we trying to serve God? Well, because he's our Savior. Well, why is he our Savior? Well, because we were sinners and we were lost and he became our Savior. So why should we follow that? Well, ultimately, you get down to for our salvation. This is about us being saved. And I'm 100% in agreement with that. So why else should we talk about the Bible and stuff at church? Usually, it goes no further than that right there. Well, 
It's about us being saved. Sometimes someone will say, well, it's about people being saved. Oh, why? Why do we want people being saved? We're saved. Isn't that good enough? And like the man in the video, I can't pronounce his name, so I won't even try. The man in the video shared this morning, the American Christian, from his perspective, is basically self-centered and selfish. And as long as it's good for us, we really don't care. Okay, so if you're going to expand that out, there's basically two reasons. Keep asking the question why, eventually you'll get the second answer, the first one being for our salvation. The second answer is for the salvation of the world. So why do we need to talk about the Bible and God and the gospel and stuff at church? For our salvation and for the salvation of the world. Well, once you're talking about the salvation of the world, now you've automatically taken on the culture, the society, the direction of the world because you are going to tell it it's going to hell. If you can't tell the world they're lost, you can't get them saved. It's kind of a basic principle. So if we're coming from the direction of, well, everything in the world's good, we have no gospel. We have no message. Not everything in the world is good, and that's what the gospel is about. And it's our job to take it out there. Well, the scriptural directs of serving God, why? it's a question to me, and you don't have to answer it, just think about it. Why is it Christians feel they need to separate their spiritual life from the rest of their life. Their spiritual life is one thing. How they run their business is different. How they run their family is different. How they spend their personal time or their entertainment time, that has nothing to do with their spiritual world. And, and we separate these two out, and that has seeped into the church. Serving God and reaching this world, that's two different things. I mean, let's just talk about serving God. That's why the world's going to hell, is because we have taken that stance. And we're useless as salt out there because we're not engaged. In other words, I've heard it this way, spiritual versus civil issues. Certain things are civil issues, certain things are spiritual issues. The church is supposed to dwell on spiritual issues and let the world dwell on civil issues. Have you looked up what the word civil means? It means pertaining to society or the citizens of a society, citizenry or the state. It's the whole population and what affects the citizens of that population. It's called civil. Versus like military is not the whole population. It's a segment of the population. So it's part of the citizenry, but the military is not the civil world. It's the, the, the thing that affects all the citizens. That's the civil world. What aspect of what happens in this world does not start with the spiritual heart of human beings? I have contemplated this from as many directions as I know how to contemplate it. Everything that happens in the world is a spiritual issue. It's flowing from the heart of a human being, and that heart is either righteous or wicked. So to divide civil from spiritual issues as a minister, I'd have to be an idiot. What is a civil issue that doesn't flow from the heart of the spiritual person? They're inseparable. You, you, you can't separate them. I'll give you one scripture on it. Believe it or not, this scripture was brought up to me. Matthew 15, 18, and 19. But the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart, and these make the man unclean. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander, etc. Okay? It's one of the places Jesus talks about it. 
what aspect of that right there does not flow from the spiritual well-being of a society or a nation? The civil side. For instance, evil thoughts is really broad. But the whole concept of we need to take, we need to take prayer out of school, that's an evil thought. We need to allow women to have choice to murder their children. That's an evil thought. And it's also murder. Okay? So now you could go down that list and call all of those civil. Because in reality, the church has no right to arrest, prosecute, and lock up murderers. That's a civil issue. The church has no right to deal with adultery. We don't hold court. We don't dissolve marriages legally. We're not the ones who change the, the legal names and everything on the tax records and blah. I mean, it's a civil issue. Sexual immorality. It's not the church's job. I mean, if some guy is raping his daughters, that's a civil issue. He needs to be sued and taken to court. They need to lock him up. Church doesn't have the authority to do that. And theft. We're not the cops. Who are we to be involved with theft? I mean, that, that's, they need to go to court. That's a civil issue. False testimony. Well, there again, I mean, they're supposed to be saying the truth in court. And if they're not, that's a civil issue. Slander. See, if we want to, we can get out of all our responsibilities. Those are our responsibilities because those are what form society. Those are what flow from the heart of men. And if we're not dealing, willing to deal with those in exactly the way they happen on earth, we are abdicating our God-given position to affect this world to the civil world? To the ungodly world? Many times, not always, but many times. We've lost our saltiness. So to separate out what's happening and what is really important and going on in society right now and say the church should just <clears throat> pay more attention to Scripture, I beg to differ. Because if you read the Scripture... Everything in Scripture applies to what's going on in society right now. And if we're not taking the Scripture and applying it, what use are we? Truth of the matter is, I believe the church has become lazy and irresponsible. That's why evil and wickedness has thrived in this country the way it has. We have been accomplice, become accomplices to wickedness. Let me explain that just a bit. If you had a friend who said, I hate the neighbor, I'd like to kill him, but I don't have a gun. If I had a deer rifle, man, I could just pick him off and nobody would ever catch who it was. And, and you say, well, I got a gun. I got 30 out six. That should do it. And I got bullets. Tell you what, I'll borrow them to you. <laughs> Who's the neighbor? So-and-so. Well, he's got a hill all right out behind him. Just lay on the hill. This gun will take him out. And the guy goes and shoots the neighbor. And they catch him, and they find out it was your gun. And that you offered the gun, and that you offered some advice. Guess what's going to happen? They're going to come and knock on your door and put you in handcuffs and lock you up too because you are an accomplice to murder. The word accomplice means one who participates in the commission of a crime without being the principal actor. Well, I didn't shoot him. Yeah, but you participated in the crime without being the one pulling the trigger. You helped it happen. That's an accomplice. A person who helps another commit a crime. So now let's make a direct application for this. So hopefully you don't get offended, but I guess that's not my job. 
I'll try to talk nicely. I want to show you how the American church, not everybody, but generally, has become an accomplice. If we vote for someone who is part of the Democratic Party or whatever other liberal agenda party there might be there, and there's a number of them, knowing that that person we're voting for will support the agenda of the party. When push comes to shove, they're going to vote party lines. If we vote for that person and put them into office, we are giving them the authority and the nod, go do this. So when abortion comes up, and I'm just going to use this one. I could use four or five of them. I'm just going to use this one for sake of time. When abortion comes up and is supported in any form by the person or the party you voted for, whether it be making new laws, whether it be court cases, and a liberal judge has been appointed by the people you voted for, no matter how it works, when abortion comes up and it's being worked with, legally or otherwise, when it goes the direction of the person who supports abortion because we voted them into office, they are now representing us, and somebody's baby or babies is going to die, and the defense of killing babies is going to take place because we voted them into office and gave them the authority we are now considered accomplices to those murders. Because we authorize them to support those murders. So surprise, surprise, folks, church, those of you watching, we will be held accountable for the murder of that baby the same way the mother who made the decision and or the doctor who performed the surgery will be held accountable. You say, well, I didn't make them do it. Yes, you actually did. You were an accomplice to the crime the same way the guy gave his neighbor the gun. You gave the legal system and the doctor the authority and the right to kill human beings without prosecution. That is an accomplice to the crime. And in God's eyes, we're as guilty as anybody else, and we're going to be judged for it. You say, well, see, there you go, knocking the Democrats. I am knocking wickedness. I can't help it. They chose that as their platform. Let's, let, we got to get down to where we live. Ezekiel chapter 3, when I say to a wicked man, you will surely die, and you, speaking to us, do not warn him or speak out to dissuade him from his evil ways in order to save his life, that wicked man will die for his sin, and I will hold you accountable for his blood. So let's make direct application. When God says abortion is murder, and he says it in his word, I mean, it... it We will spend millions of dollars to try to keep a child alive who was born prematurely, but on the basic choice of the mother, we will lay the next one on the table and let him suffocate in his own saliva and blood and call that mother's choice. And that's not wicked? So he says, I'm against this. You're my ambassadors. You're my people. You need to warn them and say, God is against this. Oh, but God, that gets messy. People will get upset. People don't like it. It's going to cause division. I mean, all you want is peace, right? Well, I don't remember Jesus saying that. He said, I actually come with a sword and I will divide. There's some issues that don't need peace. Some issues need to be cut right in half and be divided. 
if we as the church don't have the wherewithal to say, here's what it is, and warn the Democratic Party and the people who are going into office as Democrats who will uphold abortion right up to the end if we don't warn them. And you say, how do you warn them? You say, no, we're not doing this anymore. No. If we're not willing to take a stand, God says, the blood they're shedding will be on your hand. We'll be held accountable for it, be on our hands. There's going to be a lot of Christians at judgment with very bloody hands. 61 million and counting have been aborted since Roe versus Wade started. But if you do not warn the wicked man and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his evil ways, in other words, just going to keep our mouth shut. We're just going to talk about the Bible at church. I know a lot of people are getting killed, but that's a civil issue. He will die for his sins. Well, first of all, it goes back to what the guy said this morning. Don't we really care about the guy even? I mean, these politicians are deceived. They're headed straight for hell. You say, how can you say someone who supports murder, supports same-sex marriage, supports BLM, which is a Marxist, Satanist group that was formed by witches. And I could just keep listing. How can you say they're unsaved? Show me the fruit of righteousness. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, the life flows. I sincerely question somebody's depth of spirituality when they're willing to walk into a building like this and blow people away, take human life without even thinking about it, well, that's what's happening with abortion. I sincerely question their salvation. I'm not the judge. But they will die for their sins. But if we've warned them, we'll have saved ourselves. When we vote for a wicked man or system, we are not warning them. We are supporting and encouraging them. The blood they spill and the choices they make will be on our hands as accomplices. The problem is the church has become as big a political machine as the Republicans or Democrats. In America. That's why the church doesn't speak up. We're afraid of losing our constituency and our voters. You say, what do you mean? Our constituency is the numbers who walk through the door on Sundays. Our voters are the ones who give in the offering. We're afraid of people backing off from church and stopping giving because we've taken a stand on righteousness or wickedness. We, we say, you know, we make this statement. Someone said it to me this last week. Why don't the politicians just say what they really believe? Okay? Because they learned it from the church. We're the bigger hypocrites. Most of the churches and pastors in America today won't say a thing about what's happening in this country in the election. Why? There are they're afraid to lose their constituency and their voters. So as a result, wickedness thrives. Does the pastor or the church believe abortion is correct? Most churches in America would say, no, we don't believe it's correct. Then why don't you open your mouth and tell people to quit supporting those who are killing the babies that you believe is a wrong action? Because we're as political as the rest, and we've set the agenda, and we're hypocrites. We're more concerned about our numbers and our money than we are about God's agenda and his righteousness. So I'm just trying to encourage us to open our eyes and minds enough to realize this is not about something as simple as politics. Folks, 
come back out and realize there's a war going between the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. There is a war that's raging between righteousness and evil, and we as Christians are the only warriors and ambassadors of heaven declaring what is to be righteous. You remove the church, who in society is declaring it as a group? Nobody. It's us. If we drop the ball, we're, we're, we're worthless to the kingdom of God because we're salt that lost its savor. It will bring judgment. So I say it again. I'm not telling you who to vote for. You're going to answer to God for who you vote for. But I do have the right to tell you what God thinks. And God thinks if you vote for a party or a person who supports, let's just stay with the one issue, who supports abortion, he will hold you accountable for that action. It's sin, and you are sinning to do it. Why? Because we are authorizing and empowering wickedness and sin to prevail in this land. We're acting as accomplices to the kingdom of darkness. So back to the original question. <clears throat> Should we talk about political issues in church? I have a question. This is how I'll end. And I welcome any input. How can you talk about the gospel, the scripture, without not talking about what's happening in society? How, how, what kind of game would we be playing to not take the truth of the gospel and apply it to what's going on around us, to the actual world we're supposed to be trying to get saved? So I go back to what the Lord told me, which kind of just took me by the neck and shook me. He said, if the ball gets dropped in this election, I will begin with judgment at the church. Why? Because it's our fault. It's our fault. We can look around and blame all kinds of people, but it's our fault. 